Aloha and welcome. <clears throat> in this lesson, we're going to be talking about uh, Module 7, Networking Fundamentals. So let's go ahead and start. Uh, this is part of uh, Part 1, CompTIA A+, Core 1, 220-1101, or 220-1101. Uh, the module objectives, by the end of this module, you should be able to explain the TCP IP protocols and standards an operating system uses for networking. Uh, you should be able to compare and contrast common networking hardware, uh, including the network interface uh, and NICs, the switches, the hubs, the cable, modems, and routers. Uh, you should be able to configure routers, switches, and computers in a local network. So um, understanding TCP IP and Windows networking, uh, network communications begin uh, when one application on one computer tries to find another application on another computer on a local or a remote network. Most applications used on the internet or local network are client server applications. Uh, an example of this is when a client uh, requests a web page from a web server, protocols are established and the request is made and answered. The application, the OS and hardware on both computers and the network are all involved in the process. So the host is a computer that can either be the client or the server and a node is any computer printer or network uh, device on a network. Um, addresses used on a network. The following types of numeric addresses are uh, used for uh, communication on a network. You've got the port address that identifies an application, like uh, you've got uh, 80, you've got, um, you know, it just depends on what you're looking at. It could be a port 25, uh, it could be port uh, 3889. You've just got uh, different ports that uh, signify different, uh, different uh, commonly used uh, ports for applications. So um, there's also the IP addresses, which are the uh, uh, numbers that identify a node and its network connections. You've got numbers like uh, 192.168.1.1, 10.0.0.1. Uh, then you've got the MAC addresses and MAC addresses are addresses that are uh, directly on the network uh, card itself. If you look at it, you'll have a long number. The first part of it uh, signifies what the, uh, the maker. So the first so many bits are for the maker and then the other is for the unique uh, number for that one. So that's the, uh, the MAC address. Don't confuse it with uh, Macintosh, has nothing to do with it. Uh, a host name or computer name identifies a host and can be used in place of its IP address on the local network. This is like a, a NetBIOS name that you can uh, type in. If your name is like John PC, like mine, you can type in ping John PC and it'll return the actual, it'll ping because it knows what the corresponding IP address is. Um, you've got domain names uh, that identify a network. Uh, you've got fully qualified domain name, uh, names and that's uh, when you actually have the full, uh, you know, the computer network to which it belongs. So you like www.cengage.com or www.cnn.com. That is the fully qualified domain name. And if you look at a NIC like this one, you can see that uh, often there's a uh, sticker on it that will have your MAC address. So uh, that's where you can uh, get your MAC address off of. <coughs> and you can also look it up in your TCP IP settings as well. So the TCP IP model for network communications, uh, the suite of protocols or rules that define network communication is called the TCP IP stack. Uh, that stands for the transfer uh, transmission control protocol slash internet protocol. Uh, communication between two computers happens in layers. An application passes a request to the OS, which passes the request to the network card and then onto the network. Uh, in the TCP IP model, protocols used by hardware function at the link layer and protocols used by the OS are divided into three layers, the internet, the transport, and the application layers. And uh, you may have heard of the OSI model. We'll talk about that a little bit in the future, but uh, the OSI model is a seven layer model that uh, can correspond and we'll show the actual lineup between the layers of the OSI model and the uh, layers of the TCP IP model. So here you have the TCP IP model for network communications. So you can see up at the top, the browser, uh, you know, sending HTTP that happens up around the application layer. Then below that, you've got the transmit and uh, there are the transport and the uh, internet protocols. And that's where you've got uh, protocols like TCP or UDP that's going on. Uh, you're dealing with uh, port addresses between operating systems <clears throat> using your IP addresses. Then at the base level, you've got the uh, link itself, which is the hardware level. 
So you've got the ethernet uh, where you're dealing with MAC addresses. So this is a simplified graphic, it shows a, a host coming up <clears throat> and says, I'm going to blah, blah, blah. And uh, the uh, router here uh, says, my IP address and subnet match tell me the host is somewhere in my network. Wait here until we find it. So your router is going to tell whether or not you've got to uh, go ahead and push this out onto the network or if it can be solved locally. So the PCPIP model for network communications, here we've got uh, an example of uh, different systems. It's uh, computers on the same LAN uh, can use MAC addresses to communicate, but uh, computers on different LANs use IP addresses to communicate over the internet. So your switch normally has the information uh, for uh, which uh, hardware devices are on there, and it, it knows that by the MAC addresses. So uh, the switch will know what MAC addresses are on a local network and they can uh, communicate directly that way. Uh, if uh, you need to go out to the internet though, MAC addresses don't do you any good anymore. You have to uh, start using the IP protocol in order to reach other systems out there on the net at large. So the TCP IP model for network communications 505, here we're looking at uh, you know, somebody uh, you know, with a, a packet that's going up uh, on the network and they're over, they reach the final destination here and the computer with that address is uh, you know, looking and saying, uh, it's saying, okay, uh, hold on, what, ports, uh, what port are you going to? And here he's going to 80, which is the web server. So uh, you've got different ports that are available there and, and hi, I'm at port 80, I'll take it. If only it was this simple. But uh, anyway, this is an interesting graphic. Here's a graphic that I mentioned earlier. This is the OSI. Uh, model for network communications. This is the big abstract model and uh, the TCP IP uh, will, uh, it will actually, it, you can kind of draw the uh, comparisons. So uh, at the highest level, you've got the application layer, which corresponds with the OSI uh, three layers of the application presentation and session layers. You've got your transport layers, which are equivalent. And then you've got the internet layer on the TCP IP model, which is the equivalent of uh, the network layer on the other. Then uh, the TCP IP, the fourth layer, the link layer, the hardware layer uh, is equivalent to the OSI models, data link layer and physical layer because they separate those two out. So uh, in testing on uh, the network plus exam, I remember we did have a lot of questions about this. I don't think you'll necessarily have this on the A plus exam but it's good stuff to know because you will uh, get more into these differences as time goes on. So server applications, their protocols and ports. Uh, here's a list of popular client server resources used on network and the internet. You've got web servers. Web servers uh, serve up web pages of clients and they use port 80 for HTTP or most likely nowadays you're using SSL, uh, TLS, uh, you're gonna be on port uh, 443. Then uh, mail servers use uh, port 25 for SMTP for sending mail. Uh, for receiving, you can use uh, port 110 for POP3 or port uh, 143 for IMAP. Um, you've got file servers that store files and make them available to other computers. Windows uses SMB, the server message block protocol. Um, print servers manage network printers and make them available on a network. Uh, devices can request an IP address from a DHCP uh, host server that assigns addresses from a pool of addresses it maintains, can also uh, hand out uh, reservations. So one specific uh, system will get the same number all the time. And DHCP stands for Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. A uh, list of popular client server resources used on network and internet. Uh, DNS servers are uh, part of the client server system that is associates fully qualified domain names such as www.sengage.com uh, with IP addresses, their process called name resolution. Think of this kind of like uh, the internet's uh, phone book. Uh, not that you probably know what a phone book is anymore, but uh, you look up a name you know, like cnn.com and you get the address that it uh, has for it. And you can follow that uh, to the actual uh, location. So a uh, proxy server is a computer that intercepts requests the client makes of another server. Often on a server, uh, you would have like your firewall. Sometimes the firewall will do proxying where you uh, send out a request to get something from the internet. The proxy server is going to take that request. It'll, that server will actually make the request for you. It'll bring back the results. And one of the things that these will often do is they'll cache the results. So if somebody else goes out to look at the same site, they'll just keep those results and hand it over. 
Um, an authentication authorization and accounting server is used to secure and control access to the network and its resources. One protocol and uh, AAA server uh, can use for communication is LDAP, and that's the lightweight uh, directory access protocol. Um, you've also got syslog, and that's a protocol that gathers event information about various network devices, such as errors, failures, and uh, maintains the tasks and users logging in and out of it. Uh, FTP server uh, operates on uh, 20 and 21. Uh, ports 20 and 21 and uh, use the FTP protocol to transfer files between two computers on a network or the internet. Uh, you've got telnet servers and uh, they use a protocol for uh, uh, controlling uh, computers remotely. Uh, now most people use SSH for that because it's uh, secure whereas telnet sends their credentials in clear text. But uh, yeah, SSH servers on uh, port 22, not that you necessarily need to know that here, but uh, yeah, you can uh, use SSH server with a secure shell uh, client. And uh, yeah, they uh, they use encrypted communications. Uh, you've got remote desktop and uh, remote assistance. Uh, I think remote desktop is 3889 port. Uh, so uh, if you're uh, setting up, you know, uh, if you're setting up ports in your uh, router, you know, I think 3889 is the one for remote desktop. Um, and this is a neat uh, feature that you can use to uh, log into your system remotely. Uh, simple network management pro protocol, SNMP, T, uh, SNMP, it's used to monitor uh, network traffic. So you can get all kinds of uh, information on your, uh, on your different uh, network traffic. Uh, let's see, the um, TCP, the transmission control protocol, uh, it guarantees the message delivery. Uh, there's a big difference between TCP and UDP. And the main thing is that TCP uh, actually guarantees message delivery. It will retry. So uh, it will check to make sure that uh, the messages are received. It has a, a three-part handshake. The, it has the acknowledgement. Uh, well, it has the SYN act and uh, SYN act. So what happens is uh, you're going, you're setting up this handshake so that uh, when you set up your transmission, you uh, make sure that you're connected and then you start sending the data. And uh, if any data is missed in that, it will retransmit it. So that's the good thing about it. Um, you don't always want that. And in those cases, you'd have something like UDP, the user datagram protocol, which doesn't guarantee delivery. And you may think to yourself, why would I be in a situation where I wouldn't want guaranteed delivery of something? Well, UDP is good for things like video. So if you're doing a video conference or something and you're talking back and forth, Let's say it drops a frame. Do you really think it's a good idea to have it, you know, go and retransmit that frame and have that go? You're going to start to see a lot of uh, uh, latency. You're going to see a uh, jitter uh, and a lot of other issues pop up. So for some types of things, uh, it's just better not to worry about, uh, you know, fixing that uh, frame that you lost. Just if it's, you know, in the moment video, something like that, or audio, just let it go and then, you know, continue on. So that's what, uh, that's what the difference is. So TCP, you've got that three-way handshake. Uh, UDP, you've got uh, basically connectionless protocol. It doesn't guarantee it, but it's also faster. The transmission's faster. And when you're dealing with video and stuff like that, you know, having that speed is essential. And you know, having to slow down to uh, error correct and do things like that is gonna be counterproductive. So um, UDP is also used to monitor network traffic and it's uh, used by DHCP itself. <clears throat> Here's an example of TCP guaranteeing delivery. So yeah, funny little graphic. Um, <clears throat> now, how do computers find each other? Well, uh, there's a couple of protocols we use. One is IPv4, one is IPv6, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, IPv4, it's an address that has 32 bits. Uh, it's divided into four groups. Uh, each uh, group is eight bits long. We call those octets. So uh, we'll see that a little bit later, but um, when you look at a number, it's gonna be presented as four decimal numbers uh, separated by uh, periods. So you'll have like the 192.168.1.1. Uh, the largest possible eight bit number is all ones, which is equivalent to 255 in decimal. So uh, the largest possible uh, decimal IP address is gonna be all 255.255.255.255 which is all ones separated by periods in binary. 
So each of the four decimal numbers uh, separated by periods is called an octet, like I mentioned earlier, and it can be any decimal value between zero and 255. And one thing to know is that some IP addresses are reserved and should not be assigned to a device on the network. You have your broadcast uh, and your uh, network identifier. So there are things like that that you will not, uh, it basically takes away two uh, IP addresses on every subnet that you have. Um, the first part of an IP address identifies the network and the last part identifies the host. So a subnet mask is used to determine which part of an IP address identifies the network and which part identifies the host. So the default gateway is an IP address that identifies a router that is connected to the local network and at least one other network. And that's used to send messages to other networks. So if you aren't working just in your own network, you need to reach out, that's gonna go through your, uh, your gateway. Um, a DNS server IP address is used to translate domain names to IP addresses. We mentioned this before, it's kind of like your phone book. I'm hoping that still makes sense to people in this day and age. Uh, subnet masks. Um, a subnet mask has 32 bits. There's a string of ones followed by a string of zeros. <clears throat> For example, IP address of a computer is 201.18.20.160. The subnet mask of, and you look at uh, all, you know, eight ones, eight uh, ones, eight zeros, eight zeros. Uh, subnet mask uh, tells window that the first 16 bits of the IP address uh, is the network ID. Uh, and that network ID is 201.18.0.0, and the host ID is 20.160. Sometimes an IP address and subnet mask are written using shorthand notation. Uh, we call it CIDR notation. It might be written as something like 201.18.20.160 slash 16, where the slash 16 means the first 16 bits identify the network. So here is a graphic on this. The subnet mask serves as a filter to decide whether a destination IP is on its own network or another network. So you can go ahead and uh, check and uh, you know, compare these to see if you're gonna have to go out to a, uh, an outside network. <coughs> uh, public IP addresses uh, are available to the internet. That's the, uh, the numbers that everybody can see. Then you've got the private IP addresses, which are used internally. And there's a, uh, three different ranges that the IEEE recommends for that. You've got 10.0.0.0 through 10.all 255s. Uh, then you've got 172.16.0.0 through 172.31.255.255. And then you've got the, uh, the old go to the 192.168.0.0 through 192.168.255.255. The one that used to be on everything was 192.168.0.0. And then at some point I started seeing a lot of the 10.0.0.1s. Um, if you look at your router, uh, do an IP config uh, forward slash all on your system and you'll see something. It's probably gonna be the 192s or the 10s. Uh, those are the ones I find most common. <clears throat> I actually don't see 172.16 uh, ones that often. I don't actually remember ever seeing it, but uh, I think most network devices utilize the first or the third one there. Uh, then we have network address translation, uh, NAT. Uh, it's a technique that's designed to conserve the number of public IP addresses needed by a network. <clears throat> a router basically substitutes <clears throat> the public IP address of the router for the private IP of a computer that needs to communicate on the internet. So what happens is if you get a, a computer on the network that needs to reach out to a, let's say a web server, um, it's going to go through the router. The router is going to remember, okay, this guy is making a call out to this IP address on this port, <clears throat> and it's going to come back to me. When I receive it back from that system, I need to remember to uh, translate it back to that address and send it to that guy on the internal network. So that's why it's, uh, you know, the network address translation. When it goes out, it remembers where it's sending a request, and then when it comes back in, it remembers where to send that request to. And this is what it looks like. So you've got private networks with private IDs that aren't usable on the public internet. And then they go, and when they go through the router, the router uh, goes ahead and takes responsibility, <clears throat> acts as a proxy in a sense, that it will go out to the server and come back and uh, it'll serve it back to the, the system that was originally asking for it. <clears throat> now we get into the IPv6. <clears throat> the reason we have IPv6 is the number of, uh, we're, we're reaching the maximum number of hosts that we can have on an IPv4 network. And we've been fast approaching that for quite some time. So the idea is with an IPv6 address, we have 128 bits instead of the 32 bits we talked about before. 
And that gives us infinitely more uh, <clears throat> addresses that we can assign so that we can meet all the needs of all those IoT devices and uh, all the different hosts and everything that we have out there on the internet. So this is made uh, to be future-proof so that we uh, don't have to worry about running out of addresses for quite some time. So um, an IPv6 address has uh, 128 bits written as eight blocks of hexadecimal numbers separated by colons. So an example is gonna be like here, 2001 colon uh, four zeros colon zero B eight zero colon four zeros colon four zeros colon zero zero D three colon nine C five A colon zero zero CC. So each block is 16 bits and the leading zeros in a four uh, character hex block can be eliminated. So for example, if you've got this 2001.000 uh, uh, B80, then uh, you've got two sets of uh, zeros there. Uh, you can uh, rewrite that. So um, <laughs> you can uh, eliminate uh, those. You can, uh, so if you've got blocks that contain all zeros, you can rewrite uh, them with double colons, but you can't do it twice. You can only do it once. So the one that we have uh, up above where we have the four zeros, we can crunch that down to 2001 colon colon uh, B80, zero, all zeros, D3. Uh, and then you see that we have uh, another one down below it. Because we had two sets in there, uh, it's better to uh, set it up uh, with the, it, it's better to use the, the collapsing idea where you have the, the two sets of uh, four zeros. So uh, as it says in the end there, only one set of double colons is used. So the preferred method is the second one for the case that's uh, listed above. So terms used in IPv6 standards include the following links. You've got a, a link is basically a local area network or a wide area network bound by routers. Uh, interface ID is the last 64 bits or the four blocks of an IP address. Neighbors are nodes on the same local network. Uh, types of IPv6 addresses are, that you can have are multicast addresses. Those are used to deliver packets to all nodes and target a multicast group. Uh, you've got any cast addresses, and those are used by routers and can identify multiple destinations and packets are delivered to the closest destination. Um, you've got unicast addresses, those are used to send messages to a single node on a network. Um, you've got <laughs> three types of unicast addresses. You've got link local addresses, link local, unicast, or local addresses can be used for communicating with nodes within your same link. Uh, most link local addresses begin with FE80 colon, colon, and it's a slash 64. Um, a unique local address is a private address assigned by a DHCP v6 server that can communicate across subnets within the private network. And you've got a global address, that's a global unicast address, and it can be routed on the internet. So the first 48 bits in the global routing prefix are assigned by the ISP. So for our knowledge check here, um, the DHCP server in a SOHO, that's small office, home office router, is using the IP scope of 192.168.50.2 to 192.168.50.254. The subnet mask is 255.255.255.0. The technician has configured one computer with the static IP address of 192.168.1.100. The subnet mask is all 255s except for the last one that's zero. This computer cannot communicate with other computers on the local network. What is the problem and a workable solution? Well, when we look at it, <clears throat> we can see that the network is between uh, 2 and 254 on 192, 168, 50. And the address we've been given instead of uh, 50 is on 1. It's uh, 192.168.1. So we've got an IP address problem here. So let's take a look at our answers. So the computer is not in the sub, same subnet as the others on the network. That's true. Change the static IP address to 192.168.100.1. And that's where we go wrong because the 100 doesn't do us any good. We need to be in 50. We need to be between 3 and 253 there. So uh, the second answer is the subnet mask on the router is not correct. Change it to all 255s. That's not correct. The third one is the computer is not in the same subnet as others on the network. Change the static IP address to 192.168.50.100. That sounds good. And then getting to D, the subnet needs to be enlarged to include more IP addresses. Um, change the subnet mask on the router to 255.255.0.0. That's opening it way too much. Uh, that's not a good answer. And as we suspected, uh, the answer is C. The computer's not in the same subnet. Uh, change the static IP address to put it into there. 
Um, when the subnet mask is, to all, is 255.255.255.0, all devices on the local network can vary only in the last octet. Um, enlarging the subnet to include more IP addresses can work by changing the subnet mask on the router to 255.255.00, but the subnet mask on the computer would also need to be changed to the same value. So there we go. So network hardware. So this section introduces you to hardware devices used to create local networks in home and small businesses, including network adapters, switches and hubs, cable modems, and SOHO, which is the small office home office routers. So network adapters. A computer makes a wired or wireless connection to a local network using a network adapter. It might be a network port on the motherboard, or it might be a network interface card, a NIC. So the features to be aware of on an adapter include the following NIC drivers, Ethernet speeds. Uh, most Ethernet adapters uh, today use gigabit Ethernet and support as low as 10 megabits per second. In the old days, we had really sad speeds, and I won't even talk about that. Um, it also mentioned the RJ45 port and status indicator lights. The RJ45 port, um, so essentially you've got RJ45, which is the, uh, it describes the cable connection that the, the connector on the end of your Cat5 or Cat6, 7 cabling. So that's your RJ45. Uh, I think RJ11 is what we use for telephones. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and uh, with your RJ45 port, you usually have some status lights there. They're going to tell you whether or not you've got data going through it. It also, depending on the color, will tell you your speed. I think some are still like 100 megabits per second. If that's the color, I think it's like an amber color uh, or it's Ethernet. It could be green. It just depends. Check your uh, hardware maker. <clears throat> All right. Uh, features to be aware of on an adapter include the following. Uh, wake on LAN allows the computer to wake up uh, the computer when it receives certain communications on the network. So you can essentially put it to sleep. And then uh, if you want to wake it up, you send it a certain uh, series of uh, packets and it'll wake up. Uh, for an onboard uh, network uh, interface card, you must enable the wake on LAN in your BIOS UFI setup because that's part of your motherboard. So set it up in BIOS. Uh, you can also set up a quality of service. And this is the ability to control which applications have priority on the network. We'll see a, a, a graphic on that in a second. But quality of, uh, quality of service must be enabled and configured on the router itself. It's got to be enabled on the network adapter. And it needs to be configured in Windows for every computer on the network that uses high priority applications. And here's an example of uh, selecting priority and enabled to allow the network adapter to support quality of service on the network. So this is going to be in your uh, your uh, NIC uh, properties. So if you go in there, you see we've got priority in VLAN. Go in there and click on priority enabled. So switches and hubs. Today's Ethernet networks use a design uh, a design called the star bus topology, and that's basically where you have a star type uh, situation, and everything connects into the center, which is going to be your switch or your hub. Uh, an Ethernet hub is a pass-through and distribution point for every device connected to it without regard for the data or its destination. A switch keeps a table of all the MAC addresses for devices connected to it. So it knows at a hardware level where everything is. So when a frame is received, the switch searches its MAC address table, the destination MAC addresses, and sends the frame only to the device that it, uh, that it uh, goes to. So because it knows uh, you know, each uh, system that's connected to it, it knows the MAC address for each one, it doesn't have to broadcast that to everybody. So you're not going to, if you're out on this, you know, uh, over here on this port, uh, if, when it hits the, the switch, it's not going to send to everybody. So it's going to cut down the amount of traffic that comes to you that your network uh, card is going to have to ignore. Because if it comes to you and it strips out all the information and says, oh, this isn't, you know, destined for my system, it just throws out. So it doesn't have to go through all that. It saves on your bandwidth there. So, um, the, if the destination MAC address is not in the table, the switch sends the frame out on all ports uh, except the receiving port. <clears throat> um, so here's an example. It says a, a hub is a simple pass-through device to connect nodes on a network. So uh, the hub is simple. The hub broadcasts on all ports, though. Uh, that's the difference between the hub and the switch. The switch uh, is smarter. It knows uh, where the different hardware is, and it will target each one, the hub just broadcast everything. <clears throat> Cable modems, uh, to connect to the internet, a device or a network first connects to an internet service provider, an ISP, 
a cable modem uh, converts the cable transmissions to ethernet uh, transmissions used on a local network. And the cable modems, uh, remember modem means modulate, demodulate, and that's, you know, it's preparing it to go out on that, uh, you know, on the coax cable that uh, your cable company generally uses. So cable modems usually sit next to your uh, Soho router inside an office or a data closet. So to set up a modem, uh, plug in the uh, TV coax cable into it, and then an ethernet cable usually goes out of there and you know, uh, it goes to your uh, router, and then you need to turn on the modem. These are very simplistic things. Uh, you've got multifunction Soho routers out there. On a small office or home network, a router stands between the ISP network and the local uh, network. A typical Soho router usually combines the following features. So as a router, it stands between the ISP network and the local network, and it, it routes the traffic in between the two. Then as a switch, it manages several network ports that can be connected to wired computers or other network devices. So it may have four ports on the back uh, you know, as a switch, and it can uh, send things to the different devices as, ne as needs be. It can also serve as a DHCP uh, server, which means that uh, all the computers on that network can get their IP addresses, their private IP addresses assigned automatically to them. And then it'll do that NAT, uh, that NAT translation that we talked about. Um, and as a wireless access point, a wireless computer uh, can connect to the internet as well. So that uh, Soho router that has everything in it probably also has a wireless uh, access point. So it'll, be, can, it'll uh, do DHCP for both the wireless and the, the LAN connected ones, the ones that connect through the switch. And it can also act as a firewall and block unwanted traffic from the internet and it can uh, restrict traffic going out as well. So these uh, devices that you get that uh, usually it's uh, a single box, sometimes it can be two, those do a lot of work. I mean, it's not just handling, you know, it's not just a modem, it's not just a router, it's doing a lot of stuff there. That plus the, um, your DHCP server, your WAP, you know, everything. So it's a very, uh, very multifunctional piece of equipment there. So installing it uh, to uh, configure it for the first time, uh, you always follow the directions uh, from the manufacturer uh, if you're getting these things on your own, you also have to make sure that it's compatible with your uh, with your service, like whether it's Comcast or whatever. You have to make sure that it works on that network and it's certified to work with it. Sometimes you will run into issues if you don't make sure of that. And if you go to Amazon somewhere like that and you're looking up a certain ones, often it'll say what networks it's compatible with. Uh, regardless of how you connect to the router, the initial set, uh, setup should include providing a username and password, assigning a new SSID and password security key to the wireless network, uh, updating your router firmware. Uh, often that router firmware uh, is tied to the uh, network like Spectrum or whoever you're using. So uh, I find that uh, sometimes it's hard to get patches for like Netgear uh, devices. It has to be uh, you know approved by your actual uh, Spectrum or whoever it is that provides you with your internet service. Uh, change the password uh, for the router firmware. Uh, you may have to configure the DHCP server embedded in the router firmware. Um, changes you might need to make to the router's configuration include the following. Uh, configuring the DHCP server, uh, setting up the scope, what we call the scope, where you're saying what your range of IP addresses are, what your, uh, at, what your, um, uh, your reservations are going to be. So a DHCP server on a Soho router is usually configured for dynamic IP addressing by default. So you may not have to do that yourself. It may automatically be done. But as I was mentioning, you uh, may need to reserve uh, IP addresses so that the IP address of something doesn't change all the time. Uh, so some network devices need a consistent IP address and you can assign those using something called uh, address reservation in your DHCP server. You just go in there, you say, um, I've got this MAC address that's going to need this IP address all the time. And that's how you set it up using the MAC address usually. And in here is an example of something like that. Uh, in here, it's showing the uh, main menu for a router with the LAN submenus shown. So you can set the, oh yeah, you can see what the host name is. Uh, domain name, often these aren't set, but it also tells your IP address and your subnet mask. And I think this is on the, the no, this is on the internal side. This is not the, the, wide, the WAN is usually uh, your internet server provider side. This is uh, the internal side, the 192.168.1.1. So connecting a computer to a local network, uh, to connect a computer to the network, you can use uh, wired or wireless uh, connections. Uh, you'll need to install a network adapter and drivers. Uh, 
for a wired network, you're going to connect this network cable to a network port and verify the lights on it. Make sure that you've got uh, stuff transmitting. You'll see blinking lights. Uh, Windows should automatically configure the connection, uh, especially if you're using DHCP. Uh, for a wireless network, uh, click the network icon and select a wireless network uh, because you got to select one of those. Then you click connect. Then uh, uh, if you've got a secure network, which you really should be using, uh, you're going to have to enter your security key. Um, you're going to, uh, if it's the first time you've connected uh, to the local network, you'll be asked if you want to make the PC discoverable. In other words, do you want uh, people on the network to be able to see your PC? For private networks, it's okay, say yes, but if you're on public network, like if you're connecting to Starbucks or something like that, click no. Um, then you're gonna need to open your browser and verify that you're, uh, you've got internet co connectivity. My go-to is always just cnn.com, something like that, or espn.com, you know, make sure you can actually see it. Uh, on a private network, open Explorer and drill down into the network group to verify that network resources are available. Uh, to view and change network security settings in the uh, settings app, you'll need to go into network and internet to do that. Um, if you got a problem making a network connection, you can reset the connection by doing the following. You can open the network uh, connections window, and right click the network connection. You can select disable from the shortcut uh, menu and then you can right click the connection again and select enable. I end up doing this a lot uh, when I'm trying to make sure that I'm using wireless versus uh, uh, wired sometimes. If I'm trying to make sure that I'm using certain connections, I've, I've uh, often go into network connections and do this. Disable, just remember to re-enable it later on. And here's an example of uh, configuring TCP IP uh, settings manually. This is the non-fun way if you're not using DHCP. If you're using DHCP, you just click on the first uh, radio box, the obtain an IP address automatically, and it would just receive it. But uh, sometimes you need to manually set it here. <laughs> and this is, uh, TC uh, this is for um, IPv4. So alternate IP address configuration, uh, if you're using a laptop that moves from one network to another, one network uses static, uh, use the general tabs of the TCP IP version four properties dialog box, click alternative uh, alternate con configuration tab and select the user configured to enter the static IP ad uh, address information. Then you can just click on okay and close all the boxes out. So DNS configuration basics, uh, the DNS namespace is the entire collection of DNS Databases stored on DNS servers. An individual entry in a DNS database is called a resource record. Uh, each resource record can have up to six parts. It's got the name of the resource, the host name, the record type, the class code, TTL, which is the time to live, uh, length of data, and the data itself. And for the knowledge check here, uh, when connecting a wireless device to a Wi-Fi network, the network is identified by which of the following? Is it the service uh, set identifier? That actually sounds good, the SSID, uh, the IP address, uh, not so much, the domain name or the MAC address. And the answer is a service set identifier. Um, and that's known as the SSID, as I mentioned before. And uh, that is something that is useful to keep in mind when setting up uh, Wi-Fi networks. There's also things about extended uh, SSIDs and we won't get into that here. So in summary, now that the lesson has en ended, you should be able to explain the TCP IP protocols and standards on uh, an operating system uses for networking. <clears throat> uh, you should remember uh, to, well, you should be able to compare and contrast common networking hardware, including network interface cards, switches, hubs, cable modems, and routers. And you should be able to configure routers, switches, and computers in a local network. So, um, this has all been very general. Uh, the best way to learn about a lot of this is just to dig in, actually go into your settings on your router at home, go into the settings on your computer, look at it. You know, you can click on everything, look through everything, and then just click on cancel when you're done so that you're not making any changes to it. Uh, that's the best way to learn really all these things. Um, when you're at home, you can go into your router. Usually what you'll do is you can uh, uh, pull up a command window if you're on, uh, on your own Microsoft products here, Windows, go and type in IP config uh, space forward slash all. You'll be able to see things like where your, um, your default gateway is. So then you can go into a web browser, pop in your default gateway there, and that will bring you probably to your, uh, your router. 
and put in your credentials and start going through all the menus and you can see all the different things that you can control, all the things you can set up for your local access or your, uh, your uh, local area network, but also you can look at the, uh, the statistics for your wide area network, which is your, um, your uh, internet connection side, your ISP side. So uh, that's the best way. Go in, dig in, take a look, always cancel out so you're not making any permanent changes to it. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff there. Um, if you're interested in doing the Network Plus uh, you know, uh, exam, that's, you know, you're going to see this in a lot more depth. But this is just like the intro to it all. Uh, they're really going to go heavy into the TCP IP and the uh, OSI seven layer model. So keep that in mind. So with that, that uh, concludes our lesson. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm here for that. So have a great day and I'll see you in the next lesson. Aloha.